Hey, it's Brett, and you're watching Brett and some books. Uh, please hit that like and subscribe button right away. Um, we are continuing First Casualty by Philip Knightley. This is Chapter 10, Their Finest Hour, 1939 to 1941. The years of war pile on our heads like lime, and horrors grow and personal as engines, nor can I think in discipline and slime, perhaps besides some blue and neutral lake, another Lenin sorts the real from fake. Roy Fowler in Winter in Camp, A Lost Season. The outbreak of war on September 3rd, 1939, brought to Britain none of that upsurge of jingoism which had characterized earlier parts of the First World War. Years of heavy unemployment, there were still a million without work in January 1940. Lack of a clear understanding of what the war was about, the fact that many conservatives in high places still admired Hitler, the obvious determination of a substantial section of the wealthier class to escape from any unpleasantness, and pessimistic predictions of the effects of the bombing on large cities, mainly as a result of the Spanish Civil War, combined to cause a general depression of morale. Seventy constituency labor parties demanded peace, and 22 labor MPs signed a manifesto calling for an early armistice, an, an event that was scarcely reported. Yet, even in these early months, there were indications that Britain was prepared to go further in waging total war than ever before. The first peacetime conscription in British history had been introduced in April 1939 and was later extended to include women for the first time in the history of any civilized nation. The Emergency Powers Defense Act authorized the government to do virtually what it liked to prosecute the war without reference to Parliament. Every press, commercial, or private message leaving Britain, whether by mail, cable, wireless, or telephone, was censored. Everyone including newspaper editors, was prohibited from, quote, obtaining, recording, communicating to any other person, or publishing information which might be useful to the enemy, end quote. This last prohibition led to the charade whereby officially there were no compulsory censorship of the newspapers. Censors were merely, quote, consulted, end quote, by editors for advice on what information might be useful to the enemy. Technically, an editor could make such a decision himself, guided by copious defense notices, but if it proved a wrong decision, he could be prosecuted and possibly imprisoned. The Ministry of Information, planned as early as 1936, was brought into being two days before the war and grew in four weeks from a staff of 12 to a notorious 999. Yet, unknown to newspaper editors, the Allied General Staffs, alarmed by the development of shortwave radio, had decided in 1939 that as far as they were concerned, the war would be a newsless one, and that the system for controlling war correspondence would be exactly the same as in 1914 to 1918. There would be an official known as eyewitness and a number, a limited number of correspondents escorted by conducting officers, would be tolerated at headquarters and allowed to send back carefully censored dispatches on subjects unlikely to affect morale on the home front. Accordingly, in Britain, the public relations section was hastily re uh, created as part of the intelligence section of the British Expeditionary Force, and the War Office urged all the major newspapers to nominate men to accompany the BEF which would leave for France at the moment of hostilities began. There was need for haste, the War Office said, so that the correspondents could be vetted, get their commissions, learn the regulations, have their uniforms tailored, and be absorbed as smoothly as possible into the army machine. In the meantime, while arrangements were being completed for accommodating the correspondents, with their batmen, drivers, censors, conducting officers, dispatch riders, and telegraphists, Eyewitness would provide basic coverage. This time, Eyewitness was not an army officer, as in the First World War, 
but a journalist, Alexander Clifford, formerly Reuters chief correspondent in Germany and later to become one of the better correspondents of the war. Clifford left London on September 19th to join the BEF, advanced parties of which had landed in France on the day after war broke out. At the same time, four British correspondents chosen by ballot to report on a pool basis were debuted to attach themselves in the French army on the Maginot Line, where early action was expected to occur. A month passed, during which time nothing of interest or importance appeared in the press, pre, British press from Clifford, and during which arrangements to send the rest of the press group chafing up and down Fleet Street ground almost to a halt because of bitter inter-service rivalry. Clifford went nearly mad trying to find something to write about, and when he did, he had a frustrating experience of seeing it chopped to pieces by the censor. The situation for British correspondence with the French army was even worse. The French regarded the British plans as dangerously lax and developed a system for handling correspondence dispatches that made the official French communique, with its frequent nothing to report, or the army spent a restless night, appear a mine of information. Under the French scheme, which applied until French, the French surrendered, a British correspondent had to prepare his story in quadruplicate. It was then taken by dispatch rider to army headquarters, where it was censored, and then to French general headquarters, where it was censored again. From French GHQ, it went to the Hotel Continental in Paris, where a representative of the British Ministry of Information took charge and passed it to the British officer responsible for communications, who arranged for it to be telephoned to London. As it worked out, all this took at least 48 hours, and anything newsworthy left in a dispatch after three censors had handled it was usually ruined by the delay. In this period, American newspaper readers fed, as the magazine Fortune complained, a tissue of half-truths, edited information, poison statistics, doped stories, rumors, and rumors of rumors, were justifiably confused and angry. In American headlines, the French advanced in the Tsar daily, but by the end of the week had got nowhere. A second Battle of Jutland was fought. Water poured over the beaches in the Belgian dikes. The Siegfried Line was pierced. German and British planes had fought a dogfight over Southend. All, it turned out, were fairy stories. Germany learned had... Uh, uh, no wonder American newspaper offices turned their correspondents in Germany to learn what was going on. For one thing, it was easier to contact them. When the New York Times man in London was taking eight hours to get through to his office, his counterpart in Berlin, Otto Tolicius, was getting his stories through via Copenhagen in 40 minutes. It was almost impossible to get a telephone call through from London to Paris when the army was not using the lines, the Bank of England was. On the news front, the, quote, fourth front of the war, the Germans were winning hands down. Germany had learned a lot from the way the British managed their newspapers in First World War. The Ministry of Propaganda, under a brilliant control of Dr. Gables, looked after neutral war correspondence via its foreign press department, run by Carl, Professor Carl Bonner. Correspondents were given special privileges such as extra rations, a petrol allowance, and a special exchange rate for their currency. Some of them were even paid directly from the ministry itself, although a more discreet procedure was for their bills to be settled for them. A substantial house, 11 Julienhof, Julienhof, outside Berlin, was fitted out as a country retreat, and friendly correspondents were invited to stay. There was no censorship as such, and the Germans made a big play in their free Beric Terstatterstung. <laughs> I'm slaughtered that. Or freedom reporting. Uh, 
Of course, there was a catch to all this. The day after publication of Every Word, a correspondent's dispatch was scrutinized by an official of the ministry. A correspondent whose material was not considered favorable was subjected to an escalating scale of harassment, which began with the written warning, moved to the disconnection of his telephone, and could, in theory, end with his arrest and trial for espionage, not a difficult charge to bring, because the dividing line between information gathered by a correspondent and that gathered by a spy is often very finely drawn. Richard C. Hatalet, then a U.S. press a United Press reporter was charged with espionage, kept in a Berlin jail for a month, and then released, the ar- charges having been dropped. But a war correspondent's difficulties in Britain and France were far greater than in Germany, so during September and early October, about 100 neutral reporters made their way to Berlin to base themselves there. Arrangement for German war correspondents, however, were quite different. Gables had decided early on that there would be no German correspondent as such. Instead, journalists, writers, poets, photographers, cameramen, film and radio producers, publishers, printers, painters, and commercial artists, the whole range of occupations belonging to what is now described as the media industry, were simply conscripted into the propaganda division of the army, which was under Major General Hassel von Wiedel, there, the men of the PK Propaganda Company did basic training and were expected to fight when necessary. Their rate of casualties, some 30% killed or wounded, was about the same as the German infantry. But their main role was to use their civilian skills to influence the course of the war by psychological control of the mood at home, abroad, at the front, and in enemy territory. They became a vital part of the German war effort, a combination of straight war correspondent, publicist, and master of what the British later termed black propaganda. Many of the survivors have since become leading authors, publishers, journalists, and film producers in present-day Germany, and the full story of their part in their organization played in the Second World War is only just coming to light in 1975, so maybe we'll explore more about that sometime. While the British were still examining the credentials, applicants for war correspondence licenses and trying to decide whether the ensign on their form uniforms should be a C or more appropriately, said some army officers, a WC, a PK group advancing with the German armies on doomed Warsaw had set up a radio station in Dershau in East Prussia with which broadcasts as Radio Warsaw four days before the Polish capital 